To God be all the glory. A happy Sunday to all of you, our live stream viewers, and thank you for tuning in to South Bay's live stream worship. Today, we are excited for all of you to be blessed by this morning's message. Stay tuned. My message is going to be found here in the book of Acts 2.42. The book of Acts chapter 2, verse 42. And I will be reading in the ESV uh, of the Bible or the English uh, Standard Version of the Bible. Uh, lately, this is the version that I uh, have been using instead of the NIV. And here it says, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship to the breaking of bread and prayers. They devoted. Those of you who are taking down notes, you may want to highlight that word devoted because that is uh, where our study this, um, this time is going to revolve they devoted themselves. This message is entitled simply devotion. Devotion. So it's hard to forget. So if someone would ask you what was the message of the bishop today, just say devotion. And this verse speaks about the, one of the principal parts of the Christian life. Composed of devotion to the teachings of the apostles to uh, fellowship to the breaking of bread or the Lord's communion and prayer. And personally, I believe so much in this particular chapter or particular verse. That's the reason why I have the concept uh, designed uh, on our ceiling. You see, our ceiling represents the four principal parts of the church life. Millennials, that's not pizza. That is Acts 2.42. Okay? So stop craning your necks. I don't want to be blamed for your stiff neck. But that's what I believe in. Because that's what the Bible teaches. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. To fellowship. To the breaking of bread and prayers. First of all, the Christian life is actually a fusion. It's a fusion. It's a combination of God's grace and our personal devotion. When we combine the grace of God with our devotion, we create a powerful spiritual synergy, force, the grace of God. The grace of God and our own devotion. You see, it is the grace of God that actually sustains us, keeps us, and makes us stand. That is what we always attribute our success and our longevity and our invincibility. As a church, we are invincible from the wiles and schemes of the enemy, not because of our own power, but because ultimately of God's grace, the grace of God. This is what our church has been enjoying since the day this church was built 30 years ago. We breathe and we uh, uh, live and serve the grace of God. Apart from the grace of God, there is no Christianity. Because the Bible says that we got saved by grace. And the reason we are in this wonderful process of transformation, again, it's because of the grace of God. There's no time, there's no scenario in our Christian life wherein we could be able to survive, much less thrive, separate from grace. Grace, 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 grace. That is what we need to live by. The grace of God. And thanks be to God, He has made His grace so abundant 
to us. He's never lacking in grace. He is never ever deficient in grace. His grace is always available to you and me. The book of Romans 5 in verse 2 tells us that it is the grace of God that makes us stand. Look at there. Through Him we have obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand. What makes you stand? What makes us serve the Lord? What makes us overcome the wiles of the enemy and the attacks of the enemy? The answer, the grace of God. What saved us from our sins? The grace of God. What puts us in that process of transformation, becoming more and more like Jesus? The answer, it's the grace of God. But, listen to this. The grace of God could also be rejected. Yes, the grace of God is relentless. It's not going to give up on you easily. It's not going to walk away from you easily. The grace of God will always be there for you if you will seek it. But you can also reject it. The prodigal son is our example of a man. Who once rejected the grace of God. He was already living under the blanket authority and care of his father. He was in his house until his heart became full of pride. He became proud. So this son of, the fa of his father left. He rejected the grace of God and he lived his life in recklessness and wantonness. And eventually, life caught on with him. Misfortune started to pile up in his life. His life became so miserable, he found himself actually eating with the pigs. That's how uh, uh, low this man went. He, he found himself simply eating with pigs. But eventually, in that very uh, pathetic condition, the man saw the grace of God. God picked him up. And God started... Him in the way of restoration. And eventually, he reached his father's house and he was restored. The father proclaimed, my son who was dead is now alive. My son who was lost is now found. Let's have a party. Bring in the fattened calf. And then replace his... Uh, uh, Soiled robes with new ones. Give him my signet ring. That's what grace does to a person. But then again, grace can be received, yes. But it can also be rejected. The grace of God can be spurned and rejected like a lover. It can be dismissed as a nuisance abused and exploited as an innocent child. You can treat God's grace with contempt like it is a criminal. And this is what's happening in our generation today. So many people today are living their lives empty, bankrupt, lost, the reason is because they keep on rejecting the very blessing that God has given and is giving to them. If ever there is something that will make us whole, if ever there is something that will make us complete, if ever there is something that will make us truly saved and redeemed, it's the grace of God. Stop rejecting the grace of God. Stop rejecting the grace of God. Stop treating it like trash. As far as God is concerned, it is the grace that will enable us 
not just to live, but to enjoy living. In God's grace, you can find meaning, purpose, and salvation. To reject the grace of God is to embrace death. To reject the grace of God is to embrace unnecessary suffering. But when you receive the grace of God, even though you're suffering, then you will see God's strengthening and God's enabling. That is why the Bible tells us in the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 6, in verse 1, as God's fellow workers do not receive the grace of God in vain. Do not receive the grace of God in vain. Do not treat it contemptuously. Especially for those of us who have been serving Christ Jesus in this church for the past 30 years. Please do not grow too uh, familiar and too, too comfy with grace that you start to dismiss it. That you start to neglect it and to reject it. You begin to operate on the power of your flesh. You begin to operate on the power of your experiences. Instead of relying on the grace of God. Instead of depending on the grace of God. Instead of tapping into the grace of God. You are beginning to tap into your own puny, puny, limited power. You are in for a big shock. Because eventually you will realize that you do not have enough power, enough strength for you to carry on the Christian faith. The Christian faith is a target of the enemy. If ever there is something that hell is always seeking to ruin and to destroy and to demolish, it's none other than our faith. And only those who are living by faith, hallelujah, only those who are standing upon the grace of God can be able to overcome. Do not treat God's grace in vain. Do not squander the opportunities that grace is giving you. Because there are people who are actually committing that kind of mistake. Instead of taking advantage of the grace of God, instead of, of living in the grace of God, they are treating it in vanity. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 29. There are people, the Bible says, they are abusing the spirit of grace. How much worse punishment do you think will be deserved by the one who has spurned the Son of God and has profaned the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified and has outraged the spirits of grace. That is one powerful term, outrage. It's outrageous, my dearest brothers and sisters, that you will serve God as if you do not need of grace. It's ludicrous, it's foolishness to live your life separate from grace. But then again, why live our lives separate from grace when grace is already made abundant? You know in theology, in theology, are you still with me? In theology, this age, this time of ours is called the age of grace. The age of grace. Because we are now in the church age. Amen. We're in the church age. And in this church age, this is also called the age of grace. And so if ever there is something that you can also avail of abundantly, it's the grace of God. But the grace of God, instead of rejecting it, we must reciprocate the grace of God. Instead of rejection, we must reciprocate. We must treat it properly. Reciprocate the grace of God with our devotion. That's the way for you to return the favor to God. 
you know, in a manner of speaking. Because we cannot really give God any favors. Because it's always God who's giving us favors. God has favored me this morning with life and with strength. God has favored me today with this opportunity to be a blessing to you. What God has favored you with. How many among you are enjoying life? Enjoying strength. Enjoying health. You're enjoying a platform of influence by which you can be a channel of blessing to people. That is God's divine favor for you. Maximize it. Put it into good use. Do not reject it. Do not treat it contemptuously. We must reciprocate. We must reciprocate. In Tagalog, gantihan. Gantihan. Praise God. For our non-Tagalog speaking members, that's your first word for today. Gantihan. Reciprocate. Gantihan mo ng pagiging matapat ang katapatan ng Diyos. Begin reciprocating the faithfulness of God with your own faithfulness. Reciprocate the love of God with your own love for Him. Reciprocate the grace of God with your devotion. Devotion. Devotion or steadfastness or perseverance is one of the most defining traits of Christ's true followers. This is one of the most defining traits. Show me a real believer, a real follower of Jesus, you're going to see devotion in his life. He's devoted. He's passionate. He's a raging lover of God. Devoted. In the Greek rendition of the word devotion, it means to attend constantly. To attend constantly. That is the basic idea of devotion, that you are always paying attention, that you're always attending to it, that you are not missing it, you are not uh, neglecting it, but you are always into it. The idea also is to continue to do something with intense effort despite difficulties. Praise God. That's what devotion is. It means to continue doing something with passion, with intensity, with focus, with resolute determination. Despite hardships and despite obstacles and difficulties. The first church of Jesus Christ where we came from was a devoted community. A devoted community of believers. We are not meant to be just Christians. We are meant to be devoted Christians. How many here are followers of Jesus Christ? Can I hear a long, loud praise from the followers of Jesus? Praise God. Amen. Followers of Jesus, make your voice heard. Put your hands together for Him who has saved us from our sins. Come on, show your love to God by your praises. Followers of Jesus, reciprocate His love with worship. Devoted. We are devotees. We're passionate. We're zealous. We're committed. We're on fire. We are head over heels for Jesus. We're, praise God, we're not laid back. We're not laid back like, uh, we're not wishy-washy. We're not tentative. We're not, uh, I don't know, I don't know. Are you a follower of Jesus? Uh, mm, I guess so. Perhaps on a good day. You know, when the stakes are low, 
you know, when the demand isn't that too daunting and challenging, maybe I am a Christian. Maybe I'm a follower of Jesus. When the bar is set low, yeah, maybe I'm a Christian. But it's one thing to be a Christian, and it's another thing to be a devoted Christian. There's no safety in being a backslidden Christian. There's no safety in practicing our faith in a lukewarm, lukewarm manner. The Bible has a pretty graphic description of a faith who is not devoted. The Bible calls a Christian who is not devoted as a spit. Spit. Sa Tagalog, dura. You don't want to live your life like a spit. You want to live your life as, a, as someone who is a firebrand. Yeah. Amen. You need to have your heart passionate. Even in this worship. Even in this worship. I want to minister to you in the power of the Holy Spirit. For 30 years, I have been preaching in this church, and it was never my intention to be liked. It's always been my intention to be faithful to the Word of God. Yeah. Be passionate. When you praise the name of the Lord, do not be inhibited. Do not be inhibited. Do not be withdrawn. Or like stoic, like, I don't get it. You should be able to get it. Because it's a no-brainer. You're wired to praise the name of the Lord. You're made in the image and likeness of God. You have been born again. You have the Spirit of God in you. You have the heart of God in you. You have the mind of God in you. You have been indoctrinated, taught, educated in the ways of the apostle. Don't tell me you don't get it. Because a true believer of Jesus gets it. Say to the one next to you, I get it. Praise God. Be devoted. No, no, no scratching of head like, I don't get it. You ought to get it. You should be passionate. You should be devoted. You should continue in God's church, serving God's church with intense efforts. Why shortchange yourself? Why deprive yourself of the blessings of servitude and servanthood? You know, for God, the one he honors are the one who serves him. Mm -hmm. The one he honors, the one he promotes, the one he elevates, he lifts up, is the one who serves him. Turn your Bibles to the book of John 12, 26. Go ahead. John 12, 26 of John. If anyone serves me, he must follow me. And where I am, there will my servant be also. If anyone serves me, anyone serving the Lord here? If anyone serves me, the Father will honor him. Oftentimes, we move heaven and earth to be honored by fellow men, especially in this day and age of social media. Mm. Always trying to use the best editing app to make ourselves likable. We always go not just for an angle, but for the perfect angle. Like, oh, not there, because they're going to see my double chin. It's going to put it up. So that they can see at least the, you know, my square jaw. And if you have a lot of facial flaws, there's a million app you could use to, to soften it. You know, airbrush it. You use the, the right filter. And then what you do is, 
you search the wide world, the, <laughs> the world wide web for the best saying, for the best, you know, post that will, go, uh, uh, saying that will go to your posts. Too blessed to be stressed. <laughs> so you post it. And then you check it up. After one whole day, only three likes. <laughs> First, it's you who like it. Number two, you log in to your another account. So that second like. The third liker are the telemarketers. <laughs> They're looking to sell something to you. We're constantly trying to be liked, always attempting to be received and accepted. Too many people today are sad because they have bashers, haters. And we always love being around those who love us. There's nothing wrong enjoying public affirmation. But you live and die with public affirmation. What we need to seek is God's honor. God's thumb. God's like. God's like. God's thumb up sign. Hmm? That's what we need to seek. And God loves devotees. He loves devotees. They are the ones who continue doing the work of serving God despite difficulties. Christ's true followers, the members of this church, were not the surrendering bunch. We are not the ones that surrender. Are we? No. The leader of this church, his favorite saying is what? No retreat, no surrender. We will not surrender our Christian convictions. We will not surrender our Christian platform, even though it is unpopular, even though it's risky, and even though it is difficult and challenging. We will remain steadfast in our Christian convictions and teaching. We do not surrender. We do not withdraw in the face of trials and difficulties. Praise be to God. The Lord has blessed me and Pastor Tess with a great congregation of very resilient, resilient, resilient people. Praise God for the new believers of this church. We love you. We welcome you. But you are actually standing on the shoulders of the early generation. They are the ones that have been for the past 30 years serving God with passion, with zeal, with commitment. Many of them have grown older and grayer and more wrinkled except me. I have just grown bigger. Did you see my photo a while ago? For the first time, I felt so embarrassed of my <laughs> No, I'll take it as a challenge. Because when I, first, when I first ministered in this church, I was Adonis-like. Ooh. I was like, you know, so young and strong. My physique was the envy of the men's ministry. Come on, admit it. My body was V, small here, waist. You know, I think I was only like 26 in waist. And my pectoralis were like that of uh, uh, Phelps, the swimmer. Uh, yeah. I, I, my physique was V. Until age caught up with me. Now it's not V, it's B. When you on the sideway, it's B. <laughs> I used to have a thick mane. 
thicker than the Amazon forests. Now it is as bald <laughs> as the desert of the Middle East. Anyway, let's stop our self-bash. But praise God, this church is very persevering. The reason is because the grace of God. Come on. Yes. Can you express louder your agreement with me? The grace. The grace of God. This is the reason that when you were sick, you are still healthy today. It's the grace of God. You were impoverished, but here you are right now. You are well provided, the grace of God. You got lost, but you were able to return the grace of God. You were down and almost out, but here you are right now. It's still fighting the good fight of faith, the grace of God. And we have been reciprocating the grace of God with our devotion. Devotion. You need to treat the grace of God properly. Reciprocate the grace of God with devotion, with perseverance. That's how we overcome the enemy. That's how we overcome those circumstances, predicaments in our lives that are opposed to us and detrimental to us. Revelation chapter 12 verse 11 they overcame him, referring to Satan. They overcame him. They conquered him by the blood of the Lamb. Praise God. By the word of their testimony. And they did not live, love their lives so much as to shrink from death. I'm actually quoting from the top of my head about in the NIV. But it says, they loved not their lives even unto death. Revelation 14.12. God's people are patient. We're patient. This patience is divine. It's God-given. It's God-originated. Here is a call for the endurance of the saints. Those who keep the commandments of God and their faith in Jesus. You see, longevity in the faith requires devotion. You're not going to last in the faith if you're not devoted. Your days are numbered. You will not last long in the Christian faith unless you are devoted. Because longevity in the faith demands devotion. One must be ready and prepared to stay strong from the beginning till the end. You're not going to start strong and then quit halfway in the race. And you're not going to start late. You need to start right. Praise God. We have a good start in Christ Jesus. He's the author, the author of our faith. He's the alpha of our faith. He's the beginning of our faith. Start strong. Start right. And you will end also and finish the race Right, just like Apostle Paul did. He kept the faith. He fought the good fight. And he finished the race. We need to be more devoted. As we ready ourselves for the next years of our faith. If the Lord will continue to tarry. How many among you, you see yourself still you're going to serve the Lord in the next years until Christ comes. You're not going anywhere. You're not going anywhere. Tell the one next to you, I'm not going anywhere. Say it again, I'm not going to quit. I'm going to persevere. Amen. Let me say this in Tagalog. This is what we always say amongst ourselves from the Philippines. I'm going to say this in Tagalog, then I'm going to say this in English, and if you're really lucky today, I'm going to say it in French. If you're lucky. This is what we say in Tagalog. 
tatanda kaming maglilingkod sa Diyos. Di bali tumanda. Di bali tumanda. I don't care if we get old, but we will still serve the Lord. We're gonna grow old. We're gonna die serving the Lord. And more so, we're gonna see Christ Jesus return for us. We will stay devoted. We will stay committed. We will continue doing what God has entrusted to us with His God-given passion and energy. But it is not mere devotion, but devotion to what's right and truly from God. It's not enough that you are zealous, that you're committed. You have to be committed to the things that are right, to the things that are good, and to the things that are of God. Because without commitment to what is right, without commitment to the things of God, then yours is a dangerous zeal. That's fanaticism. And it is the fanatics that are destroying our generation. It's devotion that God is looking for. It's not obsession. Obsession is irrational. Obsession is unhealthy. Obsession doesn't work. It's going to ruin you. It's going to destroy you. God is not asking us to stalk Him. He's asking us to follow Him. How many here are disciples of the Lord? We're not stalkers, are we? We're not stalking. So if you see someone attending church every week, don't say, he's a stalker. <laughs> no, he's just a lover of God. Obsession is unhealthy. It's irrational. It is dysfunctional. But devotion, that is one that is approved of God. Amen, amen. They devoted themselves to the teachings of the apostles. That's the first object of our devotion. Apostles' doctrines. And so the Christian faith is not merely about affections, emotions, and, 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 and feelings. The Christian faith is very cerebral, very logical, very reasonable. We have doctrines, we have teachings, we have dogma that we must adhere to steadfastly, devotedly. That's why when Dr. Luke wrote the book of Acts 2.42, he did so, he did so in a very strategic and intentional way. That's how things are meant to be done. We ought to be devoted first and foremostly to the teachings. To the teachings. A follower of Jesus is a follower of his teachings. Doctrines. You should not be in the church because you like the band. You're not in the church because you like the food here. You're not in the church because you have a boyfriend, girlfriend. You're not in the church because your ethnic group is predominant in the church. No, 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 no. Especially in the PMCC Fort Watch. The reason we're here is because we are convinced of the truthfulness of the teachings and doctrines of Christ Jesus. That he is giving to the apostle in the church. Be steadfast in the doctrine. That's the number one consideration. Why you should stay in God's church. Why you should be devoted in this church. Because you are convinced. You are persuaded of the truth of the doctrines and teachings of the church. You see, you, one can be very zealous. One can be passionate about a doctrine. But if that doctrine is flawed, if that doctrine is demonic, if that doctrine is satanic and worldly, then the one who believes in the doctrine is going to be damned. He's going to be perishing. He's going to be ruined. 
Because what separates us from the rest of people is our belief in truth. Truth, that's what we are living our lives for. It's truth that washes us clean from our sins. It's truth that liberates us from the falsehood that are so prevalent in our time. We must be fully persuaded in the teachings of the apostles. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 10 to 14, uh, we read, let's take a look at that. You, however, have followed my teaching. You, you, you can see how Paul gives preeminence to teaching. There's a place for emotions. There's a, a place for affection. But you cannot substitute teaching with affections. Paul says, you have followed my teaching, my conduct, my aim in life, faith, patience, love, and steadfastness. 2 Peter 1.19, we have the uh, word of the prophets made more certain. Or we have the surer words of prophecy. And you will do well to pay attention to it like a light shining in a dark place. When you are rooted in the doctrine of the church, when you abide in the doctrine of Christ Jesus, then you will enjoy prosperity of your soul. You will enjoy divine guidance. We must be rooted in the faith of the true Christian church. Our worldview must be unabashedly Christian. Right now, there is a battle of the mind that is ongoing. Are you still with me? It's only 12.36. Oh, that's 12.56, sorry. Suddenly, my eyes get blurry when it comes to time. Right now, this is what the world is trying to uh, do to weaken us. They're trying to convert our minds. There are what someone says, hidden persuaders. Every time you turn on the television, every time you open a book, every time you surf the internet, every time you hear the conversation of your friends and family and, and, and the public, there are always that subtle, subtle deception of the enemy. Unless you guard your minds with the teachings of the church, you are prone. You are more likely to end up believing the way the world thinks. That is why the Bible says that we must not be conformed any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Renew your mind. Set your minds on things above, the Bible says, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Your mind. Get your mind submitted to God. Get your mind adhering to the teachings of the apostles. That's what made them overcome. The battles that they faced during the time. Are you still with me? The first Christian church was faced with a daunting force of, of Rome. They were being fed to the lions. They were being burned alive. Their children were being molested. Their women were being raped and abused. Their properties were being confiscated from them. On the surface of things, they had every reason. To retreat. Every reason to withdraw. And give up their faith. But you know what? They, stand, they stood strong. They fought the good fight. Because they believed the teachings and the doctrines. Praise be to God. The teachings of the apostle in the church. In the book of 2 Peter 1.19. They are surer. Surer. We have something more sure. Praise God. Isn't it great? You know, being sure is already awesome. How many among you are sure of your faith? Are you really, really sure? But you know what? In God's church, we do not only have what's sure, but we have something more, more sure. 
more sure. Praise God. Number two, in apostles' examples, they were devoted to the examples, to the ways, to the uh, practices and traditions of the apostles. 1 Corinthians 11.1, 1, Paul says that we must be imitators of me as I am of Christ. Be imitators of me. We follow Christ Jesus. Make no mistake about that. But we also follow the example of God's leaders in the church. Amen. And praise be to God. In this church, we have a living apostle. Many think that apostles, all apostles are dead. But you know what? There were apostles who are already dead, but there are still living apostles. We must follow his example. We must imitate his ways. We must adopt his practices, especially those that pertain to faith. For instance, a while ago, we heard the testimony of Elder Eisen and Elder Barbara. And for the past weeks, you have been hearing the testimonies of the faithful of this church and the other leaders of the church, you can interview them. And you will find, when you interview them, a common thread. And that is their obedience and submission to the leadership of the apostle in the church. The leaders in the church are God's channel of blessings. You welcome them. It's tantamount to welcoming Jesus. You embrace them. It's like embracing Jesus. You listen to them. It's like listening to Jesus. You partner with them. It's like partnering with Jesus. But rejecting them is also tantamount to rejecting Jesus. You disobey them. It's like disobeying Jesus. That's what the Bible says. Anyone who hears you, hears me. And anyone who hears me, hears the one who sent me. We need to follow the ways of the apostle in the church. The apostle is a devoted follower of Jesus. For the new believers in the church, hopefully this camp in Shuttle, you'll be able to see the apostle in person. Praise God. Get blessed by him. Share in his anointing. But the best way to do it is to imitate him. You know, even sometimes, sometimes the devil deceives us. Like, how is that, is that even required? You know, we have a number of successful executives in this church. There are many fort watchers that are Definitely successful executives. Even our, you know, leaders in this community. They are successful. You will not be successful unless you have a model. Unless you have a model. Praise God. This city has a model for success. Businessmen follow a model. In every facet of life, you've got to have a model. You've got to have an example. Amen? Amen. If you like to be a good singer, you follow what? The model of a good singer. If you want to be a successful musician, you follow the example of a good musician. You want to be an artist, you follow, you imitate and model yourself after you know, seasoned, victorious musicians. The same thing in faith. If you want to be successful in faith, then you follow the successful examples of the believers. And the apostle is one successful, devoted disciple of Jesus. Follow the way he gives. Follow the way he gives. Pastor Tess and I, he is our example in generous giving. By the grace of God, this is, you know, you know this, right? We're not flaunting, we're not 
uh, uh, being prideful here. We just want you to know that your leaders were not only good in talking. We actually walk the walk. Would you like to have a leader? Would you like to have a pastor who is only good at telling you to give generously and they themselves are not generous? But by God's grace, in this, con in this anniversary, Pastor Tess and I will give $30,000. In Tagalog, yan be pagyayabang. Oh no, hindi yan pagyayabang. It's good that you know your leaders, they do not only talk the talk, we walk the walk. I mean, it's your choice. It's your choice. It's great to be under leaders that they actually mean what they say and they say what they mean. You don't want to be fooled by impostors. And we are not the only ones who are generous. The leaders of this church, the elders of this church, even though they are sometimes and seldom testify, they give. They are at the forefront of church growth. Look at our young people. They are so committed. They are so devoted to the cause of Christ. Our young people are, are dedicating themselves to the mission in droves. We literally, I thought we're only 60. And when, uh, when I was given the latest uh, number, we have now 71 Bible students and amps. The army of God of missionaries, they are increasing. More and more are becoming devoted. I was telling our good mayor here, Mayor, we're building a missionary center in uh, Figueroa. Sorry, I, I, I made a mistake. Not Sepulveda, but in Figueroa. Just five minutes away from here. A missionary center. Three-story building. That will house our growing number of missionaries. Our missionaries are coming from all over the continental United States and abroad. They're coming here to be trained. You will not be a missionary unless you are a devotee. You will not give unless you are a devotee. You will not bring guests on Sunday unless you are a devotee. But I believe you are one. You are a devotee. You are devoted. So you will give much for the glory of God. You will bring people for salvation. And you will be a practitioner of the apostles' ways and example. And lastly, praise God. I just miss you. That's why I'm... Extending a little bit. I just miss you. Did you miss? The elders. Mm, the elders. Every one of them. Welcome me at the lobby. Said, Bishop, welcome back. We miss you. Where's your chocolate? <laughs> no, they, none of them said that. But I could see from, their, from the twinkling in their eyes, that's exactly what they were like. Bishop, we miss you. Don't worry, I got your chocolates with me. So, allow me to extend just a little bit. Amen. How to be devoted requires more than just feeling strongly about some things. There are specific paths to be devoted. There are specific ways to be devoted. I'm going to give you just two. Number one, consider Christ's as your ultimate goal. Christ, praise God. He alone is our goal. He alone is our aim. It's not an object. It is not a, an agenda. It is not some kind of a locality in our bucket list. We just want to have more and more and more of Jesus. Amen? Consider Christ as your ultimate goal. Hebrews 12.2 tells us this. Looking to Jesus. Say to the one next to you, look to Jesus. Look to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, 
who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Look unto Jesus. Look unto Jesus. We're missing the goal because we're looking somewhere else. We're being distracted because we're looking at something else. Get focused. Get focused. Don't be distracted. Look unto Jesus. Amen? Christ is our ultimate goal. Every season we spend here on earth serving God. Every year we spend serving God. Our goal is to become more and more and more and more and more like Jesus. Number, <clears throat> excuse me, number two, pursue Christ at all costs. Do not hold back. You see, to pursue Christ is very costly. It's going to require not just something from you, but the all of you. All of us. Amen. God says, love the Lord your God. With what? With all your? With all your? And with all your? Yes. Your whole totality. The entirety of your personhood. Not just a piece of you. Not just a parcel of you. You don't give something little to Jesus and that's enough. No. Look at me. What God is demanding from you is all of you. All of you. Are you ready to give all to Jesus? Amen. Your future, your present, your pasts, your poverty, your riches, your failures, your successes. In Tagalog, lahat. Pag sinabing lahat, lahat, wala kang ititira. You're not gonna have a spare for yourself. Look at the pastors, everything. Our convenience, our comfort, our privacy, our rights, our liberties. It's hard to be a pastor. It's hard to be a Christian. It's harder to be a pastor. That's why very few are becoming pastors. Because life is very challenging. But then again, that's how much we love Christ. That's how much we love the body of Christ, the church. Because when we learn to die for Jesus... That's the time the life of Jesus will be made abundant to us. Praise God. Pursue Christ at all costs. Philippians, this is the last verse I'm going to read. This is a wonderful verse to meditate. Philippians chapter 3, verses 8 and 10. Follow me along. Indeed, I count everything as loss. Because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things. Count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him. Not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ. The righteousness from God that depends on faith. That I may know him and the power of his resurrection. And may share his sufferings, becoming like him, becoming like him in his death. Praise be to God. The Lord has brought us into this specific chapter of our rich history. 30 years. 30 years. This I say to everyone. Always keep Christ as our goal. Pursue Christ at all costs. If the Lord Jesus will continue to tarry, if he is not going to return next year, let this coming year be our great venture to become more and more like Jesus. To God be the glory.
Praise the Lord. We hope that all of you, our live stream viewers, were immensely blessed from this morning's message. If ever you have any questions, any comments, or any prayer requests, please feel free to contact us on the Sure Word Facebook page. Until next time, God bless you.